morning I received a copy of Flight International dated 15th January. The late scientist and author Arthur C. Clarke said before his death in December, <clears throat> well, I don't know how many people read this and I'm rather mortified that it, not a single wreath arrived at my residence, but um, I can assure you that um, it's a slight exaggeration as Mark Twain once rem memorably remarked. Actually, of course, I'm really a backup clone. It did happen. Uh, we'd appreciate it. Paragraph, looking forward to seeing you all best. It's to Andy Jones, VSO Resources Center. Arthur C. Clarke was born in Somerset in 1917, but he's lived in Sri Lanka for the past 40 years. Inventor of the communication satellite, Clarke was a scientist before he became a science fiction writer. Now almost 80, he can't get about too well, and he's looked after by his adoptive Sri Lankan family and friends. I'll be happy to see you in March. He spends most days in his study, and last month he finished a new novel, 3001. It's the latest in the Space Odyssey series, which began with 2001 and the creation of HAL, the world's most famous computer. My mind is growing. I can feel it. Clark's seven wonders of the world include the Saturn V rocket, which took the first men to the moon, the microchip, and the giant squid. Uh, my first scientific interest was in dinosaurs, and I know exactly why, because my father, whom I don't remember much, gave me a cigarette card, and there was a picture of a dinosaur on it. That fascinated me, and for a long time I collected fossils. And then I turned to astronomy, I think under the influence of the science fiction magazines, the old amazing stories in the late 20s, but for a while I didn't realize that space travel was more than fantasy until I came across this book, which really changed my life, The Conquest of Space by David Lasser, published about 1931. Uh, Lasser was an American writer. He was only in his 20s when he wrote, he was only about 20 years old when he wrote this. I met him as, a few years ago as an old man, thanked him for changing my life. That was the first book that explained the principles of space flight, you know, accurately and scientifically in English. I just see the description of a splashdown. The parachute fills out the sudden jar. We're thrown around. We strap ourselves in the hammocks. God, God. We lie with eyes closed, then weakly open. We look through the open airlock to the Atlantic on which you're gently rolling. The part of the Pacific is pretty good. <laughs> Although, of course, there were many critics of space travel, perhaps the most famous uh, one was the statement which the astronomer Royal Richard Woolley was supposed to have said that space travel is utter bilge. Well, what Paul Woolley really said was this, all this writing about space travel is utter bilge. To go to the moon would cost as much as a small war. Well, that was pretty accurate. And if he'd said 90% of the writing about space travel is utter bilge, he would have probably been right there as well. The British Interplanetary Society, which I was associated it was formed in 1933, I believe, and is now very active, of course, but during the war we went into suspended animation. Meanwhile, in Germany, another group of young enthusiasts, of which Dr. Werner von Braun was the, now the best known, um, tried to develop rockets, and they found the only way they could do that was to get the military involved. So that led to the V-2 rocket, which bombarded London and other places. spaceship and in fact Werner was arrested by the Gestapo because he was more interested in developing spaceships than in developing a rocket for military purposes and there was some truth in the allegation after the war Dr. Von Braun and many of his team went to America they had the old choice of going to Russia and they decided no we'd go to America and that was the foundation of the American rocket program It seems incredible to me that the first experiments of liquid fuel rockets in Goddard back in 1926 I believed that in only 40 years 
They'd grown from a little thing you could hold in your hand and rose a few hundred feet to thousands of tons of hardware that could take men to the moon and back. My first wonder is the vehicle that took men to the moon, the Saturn V rocket. In a way, the Apollo program was an aberration. It was driven by politics, by the Cold War, and it would not, not have happened so soon apart from that. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. I was lucky enough to be present at the launch of the Saturn V that took the first men to the moon. And uh, I've seen quite a number of the launches, but of course that is the memorable one. At Cape Kennedy, it's a wonderful day for a wonderful event, the first man flight to the moon. Dawn has just broken here about half an hour ago, and just look at this awe-inspiring sight behind here, the great moon rocket ready on its pad, like a great cathedral tower of ice it's looked here all night and just fading now in the morning light. 35 seconds and counting will lead up to an ignition sequence start at 8.9 seconds. This will lead up, as we build up the thrust, to a liftoff. If all goes well, it's zero. The spectator has to be miles away in case of an accident. And so the rocket is a little tiny pencil on the horizon. And the countdown takes place. The numbers, you know, peel off on the board. And the suspense builds up. It seems to go quite quickly towards the end. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit, we have... We Suddenly there's a puff of smoke and this little pencil lifts so, so slowly into the sky in, in total silence. And then, a minute or so later, the sound wave reaches you and shakes you like a dog shaking a rat. It's not just sound, it's... You know, a, a physical force. And at that moment, this tiny pencil is no longer a little remote object. It just dominates your you know, f field of vision. And then because it climbs up into the sky and curves away and disappears into the clouds, and that's it. But, you know, when we saw the Apollo 11 take off, you know, we knew that was a page of history being turned. The Saturn V is the most powerful machine ever built by man. Uh, although the figure is rather meaningless, it's been calculated the horsepower is about 150 million. Imagine 150 million horses all pulling three men up into the sky. And it's also one of the most complex. There are hundreds of thousands of components all of which had to work. In fact, uh, again, that seems incredible that the engineering was so superb, and much of the credit for that, of course, goes to the late Werner von Braun and his team at Huntsville. Of course, no single individual could do a great deal, and there were about 300,000 people involved in the Apollo program, put men on the moon, and uh, the total cost was about 20 billion dollars way back in, in the 1960s when 20 billion dollars was real money. <laughs>
Truss Hello, 3,000 tons take off from the launch pad. Uh, the lower stage, the biggest stage, drops off in the Atlantic. Uh, the second stage also falls off. And, and the third stage, again, the, all the initial stages drop off one by one. We got the next step. Roger, we confirm, Skirt Step. The Saturn V is the equivalent of going to New York in the Queen Mary with three passengers and sinking after one voyage. Hell of a way to run a railroad. Yeah, Houston, Apollo 11, that Saturn gave us a magnificent ride. But I feel that the rocket will be to space travel just what the airship was to aeronautics. It'll be an important part of history and then it'll be obsolete. It was the only way it could be done in the time frame set by President Kennedy in this decade. My own book about the first flight to the moon, Prelude to Space, I very optimistically set it in 1978. I didn't really believe it would happen so soon. Actually, of course, it happened nearly 10 years earlier. The speed of development of space travel is really quite incredible. Yet what is even more incredible is the fact that having gone to the moon, we left it for 20 years or more. Oh, damn it. I've said sometimes, more than how seriously, that we don't really belong here. We were born in a zero-gravity environment. We evolved in the sea. We were weightless, which is one reason why I became a skin diver, to get through weightlessness. And we're on our way to another environment where we'll also be weightless, and we'll have all the freedom of movement. And of course, I, look, I only wish I had a chance of going to a space station so I would no longer be handicapped by my faulty undercarriage. I think Tsiolkovsky, the great Russian pioneer, who worked at almost everything that's happened in space, once said, the Earth is the cradle of mankind, but you cannot live in the cradle forever. We are now escaping from the cradle. Okay, Bruce, we see your airport. Now I'm rather limited in my movements. I don't often get out to the telescope. So I fitted a video camera here so I can sit in my office and get the moon's image on the TV screen and record it and move, fly over the surface of the moon by using the remote controls. My very first uh, homemade telescope was made from a, a cardboard tube and uh, a lens which I think came from a magic lantern or maybe a cinema projector, a fairly long focus length lens. And then I had a short focus lens as an eyepiece. Anybody can make a telescope that way. And the problem is the image is upside down, but then it doesn't matter in astronomy. From the Earth's surface, you cannot see anything, oh, I suppose, much more than the Pentagon under I think you might see the shadow of St. Paul's, but it has to be pretty big on the moon and under the right illumination to see anything. So it wasn't until you know, the space age opened that we had any idea of the surface details of the moon. You know, when we were making uh, 2001, we had no close-ups of the moon. We had to guess what the lunar surface was like. And um, on the whole, we didn't too bad, do too badly. One thing we didn't get right, and nobody got right, was the fact that the lunar mountains are quite smooth. They're always shown as jagged, but in fact, millions, billions of years of meteoric bombardment have sort of sandblasted them. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like from 60 miles? Over. Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray, no color, looks like plaster of Paris. Uh, the equator craters are all rounded off, there's quite a few of them, some of them are newer. The vast volume that's up here on the moon is uh, awe-inspiring and it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. I never expected in my lifetime to see men reach the moon. I never expected to see the exploration of the solar system done in such detail by, of course, robot probes. So the mystery of Mars, what it's like on the moons of Jupiter, all these things have been revealed. 
in the 1970s mostly. That is a big surprise and a delightful one. So, you know, these dots in the sky, my youth, now we, they're real worlds. I've seen this happen. That's perhaps the most marvelous thing. And I, I'm very happy, although I'm sorry, of course, manned exploration hasn't proceeded as fast as it would, as I'd hoped. What has happened in space has far exceeded my wildest dreams of what I would know in my lifetime. People often ask me why I live in Sri Lanka, and my flip answer is 30 British winters. The serious reason is that I came here because of my interest in underwater exploring. I fell in love with the country, found some fascinating places in it, made many friends. The place which most intrigued me, and I saw this in the very first year, <clears throat> was the rock fortress of Siguria, which I think is one of the wonders of the world. Quite as much a wonder as the pyramids or Angkor Wat or all the other ones. It's on a more human scale and it is, I think, magical and mysterious. The name means Lion Rock. It's in the very middle of the island. It's a large monolith about 600 feet high. And on the very top, uh, a mad king back in the fifth century built a palace. He had killed his own father and usurped the throne. His brother went into exile in India, came back years later and they met in battle and Kasapa, the builder of the fortress, was killed. And then the whole fortress and the palace all fell into disrepute and was lost in the jungle for centuries. We don't know exactly what the original architectural scheme was, but the most striking element is in the approach to the rock. Two giant paws, like a lion's paws. And I wonder if there's some influence of the Sphinx. A stairway leads up, perhaps through the now vanished mouth of the lion, up to the rock on the top. There are many features of Siguria which are, are unique. There's some marvelous frescoes of beautiful ladies, pin-up girls of the fifth century. Many of these still survive today, although most of them have been destroyed by weather and vandals. All around the base of the rock, these elaborate gardens, pleasure gardens, with watercourses and underground piping and occasional little fountains. Now, they haven't been operating for centuries. And the wonderful gardens all around, rather like Versailles. Someone once said about Sri Lanka, or Taprabane as they call it, from Taprabane to Paradise is 40 leagues. There may be heard the sound of the fountains of Paradise. I think that's a lovely phrase. Now, the whole place has an extraordinary romantic atmosphere and uh, it's haunted me for years. Eventually I worked into my novel about the building of the space elevator and I deliberately compared this architectural wonder of 16 centuries ago with another architectural wonder of the next century. So the novel is a series of flashbacks and flash forwards between this mad king and maybe a mad engineer, Vannevar Morgan, who builds the space elevator. The space elevator was invented by a St. Petersburg engineer Yuriyat Sutanov. If you could lay a cable from the satellite in the stationary orbit fixed over the same spot on the equator down to the Earth's surface, you could establish an elevator system and run your payloads up and down by electricity. No rockets involved. And the cost 
is incredibly small. You need about 100 pounds worth of electricity to carry a human being, a human passenger, from the Earth up to the orbit. And the round trip is only about 10 pounds because you recover most of the energy coming back. At that time, the only material strong enough to build a space elevator was hardly available in megaton quantities. It was diamond. Well, by an extraordinary coincidence, the material which would make it possible is also carbon. It's the newly discovered C60. And this material is the strongest material that can ever exist, and that could be used to build a space elevator. I'm very proud of the Fountains of Paradise because that is based on a sound scientific idea which has become more and more sound as time progressed. I've always tried to base my science fiction on reality, on known facts. Although I have also written some fantasy which obviously couldn't happen and, you know, and uh, it's very hard to draw a distinction between science fiction and fantasy. People have been trying for years to do it. But my definition is this, that science fiction is something that could happen in the universe as we think we know it is. Though usually we wish it, w usually we wouldn't like it to happen. Fantasy is something that couldn't happen in the universe that we know, although often we only wish it could. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. I've just realized that my friend Hal was conceived before the microchip uh, because it was in 1964, 1965 that Kubrick and I were working on 2001. So I guess I, Hal was conceived, if you even thought about details, as being based on uh, old transistors and maybe even a few vacuum tubes. <laughs> All present computers are mechanical morons. They cannot really think. They can only do things for which they are programmed. But this will not always be true. In fact, um, probably before the end of this century, we will be able to construct computers or artificial intelligences which can go out on their own and develop lines of thought irrespective of any programming, and which may, in principle, be more intelligent than we are. When I was a young man, I used to be fascinated by the wonderful calculating machines in the Science Museum in South Kensington. Masses of bronze gear wheels and levers, oh, as big as pianos, the high product of the Victorian technology. Never did a, anybody imagine that one day those machines, which could do fairly complicated calculations very, very slowly, would be replaced by something no bigger than a fingernail, millions of times faster and thousands of times cheaper. In principle, anything that a modern electronic computer does could still be done by a mechanical computer, but it'd probably have to be as big as the Earth, and it might take a hundred years to produce an answer. The idea of a machine that can calculate is quite an old one. In fact, the familiar Chinese abacus, where you slide beads up and down a series of wires, is perhaps the first example of that, and it's still in use. Really, what the microchip does is to use pulses of electricity. The one pulse is one, and no pulse is nothing. And since all numbers can be broken down into ones and nothings, if you have enough of them, 
the microchip just by shuttling electric pulses back and forth can do any addition, multiplication, division, and all the higher operations that mathematics is concerned with. There was a famous remark made by the head of IBM, I think about nine, around about 1950. He said he could see a world market for computers of about six machines. And that was the early form of electronic computer. And people found they could make these computers very cheaply to do extremely complicated operations. They found there was a market for thousands, millions, and now billions. I suspect there are at least a billion calculators of various kinds, from the little pocket ones everybody uses to the ones which have been built into cars and to microwave ovens, and which are doing, which are running our world like electronic slaves. way the computer has revolutionized life, not just for mathematicians, but for any scholar. I came across an example that recently about a Greek scholar who'd spent, I think it was a lady, who spent her life looking for some particular reference in the whole of Greek literature. And uh, after 10, 20, 30 years of research, she'd found, say, 400 references. Now the whole of Greek literature is now on a CD-ROM. And she put the CD-ROM into her computer, and in one afternoon, it had found her 400 references and two or 300 she'd never discovered. In other words, a computer can multiply the life of a scholar or an engineer. Almost anybody who deals with ideas can make them live for thousands of years. The next wonder I want to talk about is rather a paradox because we can't be quite sure whether it's man-made or whether it's something we have discovered. And this is the Mandelbrot set. Now Mandelbrot is a French mathematician, He's been working for IBM, and he discovered a very simple formula so simple that it's only two terms, z equals z squared plus c, and these are numbers, don't worry about the details. And this formula, if you fed numbers into it and then cranked it round in a computer, could produce the most beautiful images. Here's an analogy. I'm sure you all remember those child's books which had lots of numbers dotted all over them on a blank page and you joined the numbers up one by in order and eventually a picture would emerge. Although in principle, this is a strange thought, it could have been discovered any time in human history after we'd started to count. But it would have taken the entire human race working 24 hours a day <laughs> for years probably to generate even a simple Mandelbrot image. The Mandelbrot set does raise some philosophical questions. Uh, you can explore it, tell your computer to blow it up, and then you'll get another image which may have some similarity to the original one, and you can go on doing this forever and ever. You keep on coming across mini Mandelbrot sets that look just like the original one, or perhaps a little bit distorted. This could be done literally forever, but you're limited by the speed of the computer and its ability to handle numbers which may be hundreds of digits long, which have to be multiplied billions of times. The Mandelbrot set is the only way I know to get some idea of what infinity must mean. That's why I think this is really one of the wonders of the world. I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself king of infinite space. Although you can blow up the Mandelbrot set until it's as big as the solar system, and I did this on my computer once, uh, 
there's a practical limit to how far you can go, but there's no theoretical limit. Now, I once had the privilege of asking Stephen Hawking this question. Is the real universe like the Mandelbrot set? Is there more and more detail as you go on past the molecules, atoms, quarks, all the way down? Or is there a basement to the universe and there's nothing below that? We will discover new structures when look at the universe on smaller and smaller scales. But in the case of the universe, there seems to be a limiting scale. It is called the Planck length, and it's about a million billion billion times smaller than an inch. This means that there is a limit to how complex the universe can be. It also means that the universe could be described by a theory that is fairly simple, at least on scales of the Planck length. I just hope that we are smart enough to find it. Are we smart enough to find it, Arthur? Well, I wonder, because after all, we're still pretty primitive organisms, and the universe is very old, and uh, I just don't know. I would like to think so, but then there's a feeling when we found it, then what? Where do we go from here? I think the greatest of all man-made wonders is music. It's been very hard to choose my favorite. I thought of the D.A.Z. era from various requiem mass, when the trumpets of the Lord hurled you know, the end of everything, the finale of Sibelius's second symphony, and I finally settled on the piece of music which really introduced me to the whole genre. And I'd like to pay a tribute to my French master, Mr. Trevet, at Hewish's Grammar School, 70 odd years ago, when he tried to introduce our, us country bumpkins to the wonders of music with an old wound up 78 gramophone. And the music he played, which I still recall, was the Stokowski transcription of Bach's Staccato and Fugue in D. That, I think, is the most dramatic and awe-inspiring piece of music that's ever been written. And they used it as a finale for what I consider my favorite short story, Transit of Earth, which describes the last moments of the only survivor of the first Mars expedition, which I set in 1984, because back in 1970, when I wrote it, we still thought we might be on Mars in 84. And in that year, Something interesting happens. A transit of Earth, as seen from Mars, the Earth will move like a little black dot across the face of the sun. It won't happen again for 100 years till 2084, by an odd coincidence. I had my one survivor seeing this happen and then knowing he's going to die, that his oxygen is running out. And this is his words. I don't know what's waiting for me out there, and I'll probably never see it. But on this starveling world, it must be desperate for carbon, phosphorus, oxygen, calcium. It can use me. And when my oxygen alarm gives its final ping somewhere down there in that haunted wilderness, I'm going to finish in style. As soon as I have difficulty in breathing, I'll get off the Mars car and start walking with a playback unit plugged into my helmet and going full blast. For sheer triumphant power and glory, there's nothing in the whole of music to match the Toccata and Fugue in D. I won't have time to hear all of it. That doesn't matter. Johann Sebastian, here I come.
dream a lot. And occasionally I remember some of my dreams. I dream a lot about New York, which I shall never see again. England, which I hope I will see again, perhaps in the year 2001. And I also have some high-tech dreams, too, as you, can, as you might well imagine. They usually depend on what uh, videotapes I've been seeing last week at night or what I've been doing on my computer. So I, I do dream a lot. Occasionally I have had some ideas in dreams that have been useful in stories, but that's very seldom, very rare. I usually get most of my ideas when I'm swimming or having a massage or soaking in the bath. When I was a very small boy, probably only about 10 years old, I came across a book which made a tremendous impression on me. Frank Bullen's The Cruise of the Cachero, an account of a whaling expedition. And there was a picture of a battle between the sperm whale and the giant squid, its principal food. It was a revelation to me that such creatures existed, and I've always been fascinated by this strange monster of the deep, about which so little is known. I think the giant squid qualifies as one of the world's wonders because it may be the largest of all animals and I don't think anybody could have imagined it if we didn't know that it actually exists. I don't think it ever scared me, it just fascinated me, this enormous creature, strange creature living in the depths of the sea and only seen by human eyes when it came to the surface in the jaws of a sperm whale, because the sperm whales feed on the giant squid and dive maybe a mile or so to, to reach them. And the titanic battles that must occur in total darkness would be something to behold. There are attempts being made now to film the giant squid by putting video cameras on sperm whales and the hope is that the sperm whales will go down to get breakfast and photograph the giant squid as they do it. It's, gonna be, it's a pretty long shot, but I hope it's successful. Occasionally the giant squid is found in surface waters dying uh, and that's the only time it's ever been seen. It's hard to believe it's a remote relation of the common garden slug or snail. We don't know quite how big it grows. There have been suggestions of 100 feet or more. There have been a few encounters with live giant squids. In fact, the horrifying wartime story of some survivors who aircraft that were shot down and uh, they were attacked by a squid. Now, the squid may have been dying. Uh, I one doesn't know. In fact, there's a theory they can't breathe in the water. When the water gets too warm, they're adapted for very cold and almost freezing water. And when they come near the surface, their whole metabolism is upset and they're really literally suffocating. So in those conditions, you know, they can do anything. It has 10 tentacles, the eight like the octopus, and the two long ones with the pulps at the end, which grab things, I suppose, and bring them into its beak. It's such a strange creature and probably quite an intelligent creature. I've suggested, that this probably isn't the case, that they may communicate by color changes on their bodies because the small squids and their relations to the cuttlefish have this wonderful ability to change in a flash the colors all over their bodies, like a living TV screen. Who knows, they, they're probably talking to each other in some languages. Perhaps one day we may be able to interpret. around us is full of wonders, some of which we think we understand, others which are still mysteries. One that particularly intrigues me is a thing called 
SS-433, that's just the astronomical designation. Nobody knew even what it was like until recently, but now we have some idea of its structure, and it's an extraordinary object. It's unique. SS-433 is one of the classic unexplained objects in astronomy. From some central source, there are two beams or jets heading out in opposite direction where matter has been hurtled out in enormous quantities at a colossal velocity, at a, about a third the speed of the velocity of light. That's a couple of hundred million miles an hour. Something is shooting out in opposite directions, and at the same time, it's sort of spinning around in space. Extraordinary. What's powering it? What is it? Well, I've once made a suggestion, which is even more terrifying than the object itself, that it may be a discarded child's toy. I was only half joking when I suggested that SS-433 might be a product of some technology. If technology does proceed, as we think it will, eventually it's hard to set a limit to what may be done by a super civilization. Only a few days ago, I came across something which is even more intriguing. This is the latest issue I've received here of the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society, no less, now called Astronomy and Geophysics, the February-March issue. And in the middle of this is something really extraordinary. Now, that is a enormous structure of you know, some kind of galaxy, but right in the center is something that looks very much like a gear wheel. <laughs> some gear, it's many, many times the size of the solar system. What is it? Is it a natural object? Is it some inconceivable artifact? I don't know. What do you think? What I would like most to see is the detection of life beyond the Earth. Or even better, of course, the detection of intelligent life beyond the Earth. Possibly by picking up a radio signal from space, or possibly, and this is rather more uh, fantastic, discovering that some of the astronomical phenomena, which still puzzle us, are in fact artifacts, the results of cosmic engineering by some super civilization that would really make the human race sort of feel its true place in the universe. We've cut us down to size.